As has been tradition for over 150 years, we open each academic year with this motion of no confidence in Her Majesty's Government. And I, and I now look to the Honourable Member of Standing Committee from the Queen's College, Anisha Farouk, to deliver her speech. Thank you, Mr President. I'd like to welcome everyone here today to the first debate of the academic year. I remember attending the first debate in, uh, at Oxford in my first year, and I would just like to take a moment to say what an enormous privilege it is to be addressing you here tonight in this historic chamber where so many impressive figures have spoken before. I'm delighted that we have such distinguished guests on both sides of the, of the debate engaging with us. But please make, don't make the same mistake that I did in my first year and get confused about walking through the, long ro uh, the, long ro the wrong lobby. If the proposition loses tonight, I'm going to be blaming it on confused freshers. The annual no confidence debate epitomises what the Oxford Union stands for. Free debate of the most important issues facing our nation. An enormous task falls on the proposition tonight. We are lucky to live in a nation where we have the right to free speech and with this right comes a responsibility to hold this horrific government to ac account for its shocking failures. I especially am very grateful for this opportunity to rant about Tories for 10 minutes, which some of you might know is a favourite pastime of mine. And this time, hopefully, people will actually listen. When you vote tonight by walking through that door, do not consider whether you prefer the governance of Theresa May or the governance of Jeremy Corbyn. We're not debating whether we would prefer the Conservative government were replaced by a Labour one. All of us, from ardent Brexiteers to passionate Europhiles, Momentum members to Rhys Moggites, should have no confidence in this government to steer us through the biggest peacetime crisis this country has faced in decades, and to address the still blatant inequalities and injustices unleashed by the 2008 financial crash. When I first started planning this speech, and Googling all the angriest adjectives I could find, I was overwhelmed by the sheer number of problems in this government that came to mind. I had to stop myself from writing a speech longer than any essay I've ever written. A spectre is haunting Theresa May. That spectre is Boris Johnson. <laughs> Her leadership is weak, and her par party are turning to others for leadership. Turning to the likes of Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and Michael Bove. Her party is fractured, and the public's faith in her ability to do the job is non-existent. How can we have confidence in a government that doesn't seem to really have any confidence in itself? But probably the biggest sin that Theresa May has committed, she's completely ruined Dancing Queen for me. <laughs> Before I continue, it is my great privilege to introduce the esteemed opposition here tonight. First speaking, we have the Treasurer of the Oxford Union, Mr James Lamming, a third year class classicist at, Oxford, at Exeter College. This is Mr Lamming's third time speaking at the Oxford Union, and I really do hope that this speech goes better than the last one where <laughs> Mr Lamming where Mr Lamming lost the last page of his speech and descended into a panic. <laughs> I would suggest searching it up on YouTube, but luckily for him, uh, the last part has been edited out of the clip. <laughs> um, but don't worry, he definitely has all of his speech. I made sure to check before entering the chamber. Um, our next speakers are two uh, Conservative MPs, and it was actually very easy for the union to get a hold of them after the Tory party conference app accidentally gave its users access to the contact details of... <laughs> ..accidentally gave its users access to the contact details of MPs and journalists attending the conference. We have Sam Gima, MP and Universities Minister. Mr Gima is a former president of the Oxford Union. I hope you have your membership card, Mr Gima, as your vote may be needed in another very important debate immediately after this one. 
Mr Gima has spoken about the issue of free speech on university campuses quite a bit. I hope that tonight, by our criticism of his government, we can prove to him that our university embraces free speech and debate. Finally, we have the Right Honourable Brandon Lewis MP and Chair of the Conservative Party. I'm especially glad that we have invited Mr Lewis since he finally has the opportunity to speak to an audience larger than 50. <laughs> an opportunity that was not afforded to him by a uh, Conservative Party conference this year. Um, I, I did warn Mr Lewis before the debate that there would be some gentle ribbing, so please don't think I'm too mean. <laughs> some of you might remember a now infamous tweet from David Cameron. Britain faces a simple and inescapable choice. Stability and strong government with me, or chaos with Ed Miliband. I really wish we'd chosen chaos with Ed Miliband. <laughs> the referendum Cam Cameron called has plunged us into the biggest constitutional crisis of recent decades. Poor Theresa May wouldn't be able to command confidence from anyone, even if she paid them. Even if she paid them exactly £1 billion, like she did with the DUP in exchange for their support during Brexit negotiations. The confidence and supply agreement Theresa May reached with the DUP was clearly breached yesterday by the DUP's abstention on the Agriculture Bill. They're now threatening to vote down next month's budget and sabotaging Brexit negotiations. On top of this, the government is showing an utter disregard for the border problem in Northern Ireland. We are walking into a no-deal Brexit that threatens to unleash the ethno-nationalist conflict of the Troubles in Northern Ireland that plagued the 20th century. If you've not really been following the Brexit negotiations since the triggering of Article 50, don't worry, because not much has been achieved. And the scary thing is we're a mere five months away from exiting the European Union. So far, we've had Jeremy Hunt, Foreign Secretary, compare the EU to the USSR, display, displaying the same incompetence that he showed us as Health Secretary. Never mind that the European Council President, Donald Tusk, helped create the Student Committee of Solidarity the po Polish trade union that organised against the communist government of Poland. The disunity of this government over Brexit is shocking. Every day, May is undermined by her own front benches. Most recently, Penny Mordaunt, International Development Secretary, failed to state her support for May's Chequers plan. I saw a comedian the other day, Ahir Shah, who I think put it best when he said, this government is like a person that has walked into a poll and is trying to style it out. The divides so poignantly exposed by the 2016 EU referendum have not been healed in the slightest by this government as they've stumbled through negotiations. A society should be judged by how it treats its most vulnerable. Our government should be condemned for its treatment of disabled people, immigrants and the homeless. Disabled people have had their rights trampled upon by this Conservative government. It is a callousness that I cannot understand. The Equality and Human Rights Commission, in a damning report to the UN, revealed that one in five disabled Britons have had their rights violated. We've seen suicide rates soar amongst disabled people as their benefits have been slashed and their dignities violated. And yesterday was, mental, was World Mental Health Day. The government marks this, marked this day by the creation and appointment of a new suicide prevention minister. Matt Hancock, the health minister himself, said that mental health resources have been under-resourced and undervalued. A report by the National Audit Office, released on Tuesday, showed that even if current plans to spend an extra £1.4 billion on the mental health sector was fulfilled, it would not be enough, with one of the prime reasons for this being the government's continued failure to address the issues of staff shortages in the NHS. And yet, yesterday, the Prime Minister had the audacity to say, this is a government that gives mental health the attention it deserves. This is the Prime Minister that forces young people to wait months and travel over 200 miles to access services and treatment and cut 5,000 <coughs> mental health nurses. <coughs> as well as World Mental Health Day yesterday, it was also World Homeless Day. Homelessness is an issue we see every day on the streets of Oxford. <coughs> In the city centre, you'd find it difficult to walk by a, a doorstep after 7pm and not find a rough sleeper with their blankets covering them. 
I attended a vigil last year for a rough sleeper who had died and left behind their husband. I couldn't stop crying when her husband spoke of her and yet my pain was nothing near to his. People have died as a direct result of this government's policy. The biting effects of austerity have seen people priced out of homes and become reliant upon the, the kindness of strangers for their meals. However, the kindness of strangers who donate money to the homeless is not what they should be reliant upon. We should have a government that provides stable council housing to those that cannot afford their own. Another failure of this government is, of course, the hostile environment policy constructed under Theresa May during her time as Home Secretary. The policy effectively worked to create an underclass of mainly foreign, ethnic minority workers, allowing their exploitation and removing any safety net that they've had. The principle of deport first, appeal later has meant that in 2018, the Home Office has lost over 75% of their appeals against applicants for refugee status who challenge rejections by the Home Office. Applicants are put through unnecessary trauma. Imagine being dragged in front of a judge, forced to recount the horrors you faced and the persecution you fled. Then this impartial judge decides that you would be at risk of torture or death if you were sent back, and so you think that's the end of it. You think you're safe. But then the Home Office, in a desperate bid to keep immigration figures below an arbitrarily set number, appeals the case, and you have to go through the process all over again. And 75% of this time, the judge sides with you, and the trauma you suffered during the appeal was unnecessary. The humanity of such appeals must be questioned. During all of this, it's also likely that you were locked up in a migrant detention centre. The majority of people held in such, in such centres are those who have claimed asylum. There's one detention centre here in, Ox in Oxfordshire, actually, Campsfield. I visited Campsfield and it looks like a prison with its 20-foot high razor wire-topped fence. Except in most cases you've committed no crime, you're just waiting to be granted refugee status. Your only mistake was trusting that you'd be able to come to the UK and be safe. On top of this, there have been multiple cases of sexual assault at these detention centres, and yet we continue to lock vulnerable women up in them. The hostile environment policy has not only caused agony for refugees and immigrants, but also for British citizens. Earlier this year, we saw the eruption of the Windrush scandal. The treatment of the Windrush generation who arrived here invited by the government and have lived as citizens and contributed to every part of British society has been horrific. This government detained citizens, denied them their legal rights and in 63 cases wrongfully deported them. Uprooted their whole lives, forced them out of the country they'd been living in for decades and when they tried to come back they were denied re-entry. The hostile environment policy is one of institutional racism. When it fails to recognise black citizens as citizens, it cannot be described as anything else. And so, I appeal to your humanity, to your reason, and to your desire for competent, compassionate leadership. This government cannot provide that. They are in disarray. We cannot have confidence in this government to improve our country. I urge you to walk through the I-lobby and vote for the proposition tonight. Thank you.